So back in August, we had kind of already made a decision that we were not going to drive a 2025 Formula Drift season. And I was looking towards the future and for me, like what drifting would be. So we found this Porsche 718 uh, Cayman and we immediately, it was such a good deal that we were like, this is it. We purchased it and it was in the New York area. So we sent it immediately to Jordan at RK2. So immediately Jordan jumps on it, adds two pounds of boost and a couple degrees of timing and the clutch slips. So we were dealing with trying to tune it a little bit on the dyno, but really just figuring out how to disable all of Porsche's stability management, wheel speed sensors, transmission gear speed sensors, all the things that basically Porsche puts in the car to allow you to drift, but not really completely unlock everything. So Jordan was instrumental in figuring that out so that we could get something that was basically fully unlocked and ready to be used, an open source drift car. So at this point, clutch is slipping, it's at Jordan's, he's disabled a lot of the things that we need, and I have not seen the car yet. So we go up to New York, we drove an event, and we picked up the car while we were there, and I was absolutely amazed at the quality of the car because we got such a good deal on the car, and it made so much sense to purchase it, that I was like, there's gotta be a catch. Outside of the clutch slipping, there wasn't really a catch. So we got the car back, put it on the lift, and started looking at everything. And any of the areas of concern with the car, because it had a very, very small hit on the back right corner, but was fixed, um, there basically was no damage. And whoever had owned it previous and fixed it used all OEM Porsche parts, because it still had all the OEM Porsche stickers on it. So good repair, great car, on the lift, go over everything, can't really see anything. So we knew it was time to move forward. So we put the car on the lift and we started going through and scanning everything on the chassis. We realized that Porsche pretty much nailed this from a drifting perspective. I know it's for sure on accident, but the amount of anti-squat, the roll center, and basically the entire toe and camber curve in the back from the factory is almost perfect. Like there's almost no changes needed. And the changes that can be done can be done literally by just spacing factory style arms. Because everything was really, really good from the factory, we decided to not redesign the entire rear suspension and the geometry of everything. Go with SPL parts, buy their basically replacement parts that replace everything in heim joints and give about an inch of adjustment on every aspect. So that way we could have the alignment that we want adjust the anti-squat, the toe, and some of the roll center, and that's really all we're gonna do. Rear suspension is like the most important and coolest part about this, and it's because it has a very long trailing arm. Um, I think the stock length is right at about 21 or so inches total. It's pretty sick. Basically what that does is it allows the rear suspension and the tire to get planted further forward in the chassis, so that way, you can adjust that arm to create how much anti-squat you'd like, how hard the tire hits the ground, and then control how fast the tire hits the ground with a shock. And this design is ins insanely simple stupid. So basically you have a toe arm, and it's gonna do almost only toe because of the location of the arm. It goes here. And then you have the trailing arm set up, which is built out of a lower control arm that has a pivot. This will be the replacement of the actual trailing arm itself. So SPL did a really sick job of doing this. And you have misalignment spacers that go here that can tilt that arm up and down. Basically, they've got that adjustable there. The length is adjustable. They've got adjustable holes here that will allow you to move the trailing arm in and out. I put it in the outer position because it's already farther in than the stock one. I don't need any more clearance. And then we have a ton of roll center adjustment on the outside. Um, that's going to help a lot in the actual setting up of the car, changing the camber and toe curve a little bit. We got it installed. It looks sick. I love it. Um, I don't have, obviously, alignment specs, but I did set the trailing arm to give us a half inch uh, more of wheelbase, uh, lower ball joint to the pivot point of the, uh, I'll call this the trailing arm. Um, because it basically is traction trailing arm. I've got all of the anti-squat pulled out of it right now, and there's about an inch total of adjustment there, which is cool. That's in the factory setting. I bet we will cut this out and build a fixture that goes there and bolts to the body, so that way I can have two inches. It would be really sick because I am not gonna compete in FD with this car probably, 
to do that and then put a giant threaded rod in there that went into the car. So if I wanted to adjust the anti squat, I could just do it with like, let's say a 24 mil wrench on the inside and just adjust the track bar, bud. And uh, that would be really sick. It's definitely possible. Uh, another way to do it would be just have something come out the side with the gear drive, but either way. So I've got that on there. I've got the arm at its shortest length right now uh, and the tow rod close to its stock length. So there's definitely probably some tow in right now. Um, but it's all installed. It was really easy. It has a little ride height sensor right here as well. A little sensor rod. So that way it will still have its reading in the ECU, which we are going to pull data from and use. So here's the stock arm in comparison to the SPL arm setup. I already nicked it. Did. I messed it up, dude. I got some black bear polish. It, dude. I did so good. I used their, even used their little wrench. Oh. Cutest wrench ever. So that it wouldn't scratch it. Anyways. Stock arm versus their arm setup. You can see no adjustment in the length of the arm or the ball joint location. There's no adjustment in the anti squat because it's got a giant uh, like ball joint type deal in there. Um, and then no roll center adjustment in here. Um, I've got all the roll center out of it right now because I want to play with the schematics of it and see how the uh, camber and toe gain works so I can move this around a little bit to change that. Um, but in theory, this setting right here is kind of more direction I think that we want to be in. We'll see. Um, but yeah, again, no adjustment there. Um, and then it has this big giant hockey puck bushing in here. So there's going to be a bunch of adjustment in play there. So we didn't uh, use that at all. It's solid mounted now. So this should be a lot better to move through its uh, paces. So like I said, I'm really, really excited about it. One cool thing I thought that was neat, um, high clearance bolt that goes through here with the ball joint uh, taper. So you're basically now just have your own bolt with a misalignment spacer in there that has the taper to the ball joint. Instead of having it be stuck or two pieces, you can just replace just the ball joint taper if you need to. Same thing with this bottom piece here, this bolt that goes all the way through has a ball joint taper in it, which is nice. Um, and then you got all your roll center adjustment here. So you're looking at about an inch of roll center adjustment there, um, about an inch of anti-squat adjustment there. And, uh, yeah, it's pretty sick. This is real exciting with this rear suspension. I'm really, really pumped to try it. I'm taking all of the forward bite out of the car right now by taking the anti-squat out um, and having the roll center like this. And I'm putting all the side bite in the car because that's kind of my thought process in the beginning with this car is to put as much side bite as we can into it because the mid engine, it's gonna have a little bit of a pendulum effect, not very much. Um, but it's gonna have plenty of forward drive. I don't think we have any limitations on the forward drive. So let's get all the side in it and then we can start pumping the forward in it with uh, the shocks, the anti-squat. Continuously working on the rear, because this is a mid-engine car, we ended up going and pulling the gearbox apart and welding the differential that's in it. So it comes factory with a differential that is insanely simple to weld. We've got the gearbox out. I've got the diff out, which is super cool about this car. In the car, you just pull the axle, pull this plate, the whole diff comes out. And then you can weld the diff and put it back in. It holds itself as a housing with all of the lash and everything set already. And you just pop it back in. So that's a really cool feature. Well, I kind of had a quick look at these stub shafts too. Less than ideal in uh, size and strength. So we're definitely, uh, chance in it here a bit but gearbox is out it's pretty light um, without the diff in it it's very light uh, I moved this around and put it on the forklift by myself um, it's probably about a hundred pounds 115 pounds and then obviously because it's a transaxle so everything's all in one you can see this gear pump right here for uh, the oil pump so that it can pump oil uh, through the cooler to cool it it's been really cool uh, figuring this car out and uh, finding all the little tricks of the trade so far. We pulled the gearbox out because we wanted to investigate more, but after we realized that, when you buy one of these and you want to build it, you can probably weld the diff in 45 minutes. Continuing with the gearbox, we went ahead and upgraded some of the gears inside of the box to keep some more strength in second, third, and fourth gear because that's where we feel we'll be. The gearing in the gearbox is a little bit long, so we'll discuss that further on and try to figure out what we need. But at this point, we're a little bit beefed up on the gearbox, welded diff, and uh, now we have to worry about the clutch. Obviously it slipped right off the bat, so we know we needed something a lot more robust than the factory because the clutch, when we took it out, still had plenty of meat left on it. It's basically meant to only hold the amount of power it makes stock. So the minute you start making some more power, you're gonna need a new clutch. 
So we went with Comp 1 Clutch and they built us out a completely redesigned setup with a single mass flywheel and their clutch and disc. Um, it took quite a few tries to get it right because of the spacing with the differential and everything inside of the gearbox is very tricky and it has to be absolutely perfect to work well. So on our third shot of getting a flywheel and disc set up in, we ended up being able to get it right, but only after we changed the diaphragm and a bunch of other things to get it to work well with the Porsche clutch. So we've done the R&D, this clutch hopefully will be available and people who want to drift one of these or make more power will have one available now. All right, so we got some overnight parts from Comp 1 clutch and we're hopefully going to stick this trans in today. Uh, we'll get this flywheel fitted, clutch on, and then pop it in the car and see where we're at. So then we ran into our first major problem. I went out to the car one day to move it and it wouldn't start. And obviously being a new car and having a lot of CAN bus and tons of wiring, you immediately just plug in a scanner and start trying to figure out what's wrong. Doing all the same stuff, basically clutch in, turn the key, park assist, parking brake, front level control, because I don't have that anymore. Power steering, which nothing was really touched there. Stability management, which is uh, parking brake control, gateway control. Fall. Lots of codes from all the things we had already disabled to try to get the uh, wheel speed and the actual power band to go all the way to the rev limiter. I had the car on the lift, went over everything, and basically decided, hey, I'm gonna send this to someone who knows what's going on with Porsche stuff and Precision Sport over in uh, Oviedo. They have a guy there that's really well uh, versed in Porsche stuff. I took it over to him. He called me 20 minutes after I dropped it off and said, there's a ground missing from the motor to the chassis, connected it, it fired right up. So it was really good that I only wasted about four hours trying to diag it. It took him 20 minutes to put it on a lift and see. I don't know if it was a common problem for it to come loose or whatnot, but the nut had completely fallen off and the ground had completely come disconnected. So I was really happy to get a call, have it fire right back up and get right back to work. Obviously being a drift car, number one priority is the steering feel and the geometry. So one of the things that's interesting about this car is it does have a full electric rack. Um, Porsche has done a really good job of designing that to keep a lot of feel, but we wanted to amplify that as much as possible because it's always easy to bring it back. So we went with SLR for the front steering and we're using an entire billet upright that reuses basically nothing from the Porsche. Um, it basically converts everything over to similar to E36 geometry in the front with the caster trail and everything in the knuckle. And then we use F30 style brakes, uh, brake rotor with the Porsche caliper on there. Um, we might upgrade the braking system later to get a little bit more weight out of it, but for right now it's on there. Um, it's got adjustable Ackerman, adjustable trail, and everything bolts together and it's very modular. So we can basically click print after changing something and print little pieces to bolt on to change the all entire front steering geometry. We ended up with about 65, 66 degrees of steering angle and we were able to tuck it under the stock fender with like eight degrees of front camber. Um, it will actually work really, really well because at the amount of angle that I drive at the most, which would be like 50 to 60, the tire is really, really flat which is a little bit different than what we would do in the past because we'd normally be worried about jacking a lot of weight onto the rear at high angles. But because of the way the front suspension is designed, the weight distribution, I think it's a really good stab at the first attempt. I'm gonna put 540 in it because it calls for 040. I think that maybe we can try 1060 in it after we do some testing, but I think this is gonna be good for right now to stick with good oil. That is the OEM spec. So we ended up getting uh, some Recaros for this. I went against the Hans ones, especially in the beginning to get some testing done. I felt like it was best to do like one of these simpler ones that allow some head clearance. Once we start doing some tan and this stuff, we'll probably end up going to something with a halo. But um, these, uh, the pole position seemed to be a good one just to start with. Fitment's good. We used a mount, just an off-the-shelf one off the internet. The seems pretty low, we got plenty of room here. Uh, once the cage shows up, we'll be able to finally place that. Handbrake location, be somewhere in here. We'll see there's lots of rib nuts in the chassis too, so we'll be able to probably just make a plate that's pretty large off of that. And we're gonna use the stock column for right now. That way we can uh, 
get everything positioned. It has electric steering rack still. So we'll use all that stock stuff, utilize that for the crossbar. So we have lots of adjustability. There's like three inch in and out and up and down on the column. So lots of adjustment. I wasn't able to find any 718 doors, but after looking and researching, I found that 981 doors would fit. So obviously we don't have the door handle on right now, but you can see the door handle cutout is very different. But everything else, the entire door, the mirror, everything's identically the same. So I put these doors on there for now because we're going to ship those up to my buddy in North Carolina. He's going to make some carbon doors so we can save some weight. Plus, those doors are about 1000 to 1500 bucks a pair. And for carbon, I'll be around the same amount. So we're going to do that instead and save a lot of weight. These doors are only like, I think I paid 600 bucks for these, both of them together. So a lot cheaper, so a good placeholder for now. Also, it's fun that if you're building one of these, you can get doors that are simpler and cheaper. So being that this is a test mule, I really wanted to keep it very like Porsche oriented. And the reason being is like, I want it to be something that guys who are into Porsches appreciate and like. And I think the balance of having a nice interior drift car is cool a for drifters and the style of it but b keeping like that porsche race car feel to it they always kept mostly stock dashes in the car they integrated a lot of the factory pieces so we wanted to do that because it is a test mule and we're not super worried about how light we can get it it's much more important to have something that's like very cool and exciting and keeps me intrigued in what's happening so we ended up calling cage kits and they came and scanned the whole car so we have a really really tight fitting cage that's safe and very well planned out. It is the best planned out cage I've ever done and seen. Like it, everything fits perfect. The few things that I wanted to change to keep engine access and all of that much easier, they were able to do. Um, all the fitment of the parts were absolutely perfect. The only tricky thing we had is there's a couple parts on this car that are completely aluminum where the cage would have to land. So. A lot of it's welded in, and some of it's bolted in with FIA-related bolts. So. The steering will make you feel right at home. Yep. I didn't have another wheel to put in it. Look at this thing. It's like a race car now. Chelsea, you're not the race car. That's it, dude. This is you. <laughs> Look, you can floor it already. You won't, but you can. <laughs> okay, so things are coming along. Uh, clutch works. Uh, we got our NRG steering wheel mount on. I have an old, very old steering wheel on there right now because I haven't received my new one yet, but it goes right on. Steers, got our console done. The handbrake is finished mounting with everything. Uh, this still works, everything's good there. There, it did start, there we go. Oh yeah, all the turbo noise and all of the We're good, bro. I'll measure it for you. Stock is 97.4 inches. We have been an overachiever at everything we've built so far in this shop. Let's see where we're at here. 99 and a half. We only stretched it two inches. How's that a thing? Only two inches. We'll have to see where we're at and make some adjustments. Womp. Womp. Keeping most of the interior, the Navi, the dash, the center console and all that. Tucking the handbrake in so you don't see the master brake bias controllers behind. And it's kind of just a nice car that you get in and the content from the inside of the car should look like we're in kind of like a factory Porsche doing what we do. So I'm really excited about how it fits. Uh, the Recaro seat fits really nice. It's comfy. It's low. It's exactly where we need it. We were able to just buy the mounts online directly so that they went in perfect, centered, adjustable. Basically, you can slide the seat forward and back in 20 seconds at this point while still having everything hard mounted. So Porsche did a really good job on this 2.5 liter turbo. Um, we haven't got to turn the power up yet past where we are, but it does really well in the mid range. And that's the most important thing. A lot of people might be like, why didn't you build a GT4? Or why didn't you do something, a different engine? This engine is actually extremely strong. Um, people have made 600 plus on the stock engine and the response in the mid range is crazy, like 500 plus foot pounds of torque at 3,500 RPM. So, and it revs all the way to 75 pretty much stock. 
a lot of people might say there's a better choice of the GT4 engine or one of the more motorsports grade engines, but it's really hard to beat the power band of this engine being that it's on and popping at 3000 and goes all the way to 75 in basically stock form. Whereas the GT4 and some of the other motorsports NA engines, while they have a lot of response, as people would say, we're already spinning the tires to that point. So that instant hit of power, like while you're cracking the throttle open, doesn't quite matter. The torque that hits immediately with the turbo car is much more important. So while a GT4 with a tune, headers, exhaust that you spend a ton of money on might make, you know, 370 foot pounds of torque and 450 horsepower, with a tune and a downpipe, this will make 500 foot-pounds of torque and 450 horsepower. We'll probably end up putting a bigger VGT, like factory replacement style turbo on it that could put us up to about 600. Um, right now it'll be right at about 400. The intercooler and all of the cooling system at this point, we haven't tested yet, so we'll see and how that works and maybe improve as we go. I uh, realize it's kind of neat. They put the flange right here for running a uh, center radiator too. And they just have a cap that goes, so when you want to put a center radiator in, so you have three radiators, then you can uh, just pop that out and put a hose on there. These are gonna go. Uh, the reason those are gonna go is obviously, if we get a hit here, <laughs> we're busting the radiator, putting coolant everywhere. That's not what we're about. So we're gonna go ahead and build out a radiator inside of the frunk that will be, at this plan is to just tilt it a little bit cut out the bottom side of this and build a duct and then come up and uh, exit out the back side of the hood. It will be okay for testing and we can get some idea of what we need to update, but probably after the first test day, we're gonna need some cooling upgrades. In terms of the exhaust, uh, it has a very weird exhaust system from the factory that goes dual over the axles for clearance. And I think that's simply for the tire clearance. So what we did was a three and a half inch stainless uh, side pipe that has a V-band and then it connects to three and a half inch Tycon bends to go titanium out the back over the axle. And it ends at the axle simply because we want to keep as much clearance as possible and to make it as serviceable as possible in the back of the car. I think that will kind of help the sound of the car as well, not having it be able to crackle as much off of like things outside because it will bounce off the floor first. One of the coolest things about this build is the unknowns. I didn't scale this car on purpose when we stripped it down because I thought it was gonna be heavy and I didn't wanna be so conscious about the weight in the very beginning of the build. I wanted to keep it as simple as possible and focus like eyes on the prize type of thing. Um, I went on the forums, did some Googling for the weight distribution and figuring it out so that way we built it in a way that made sense. But it ended up being very light. Uh, it's 2610 without me in it um, and right at 2800 with me in it, which is about 350 pounds lighter than I thought. So I'm really excited about the weight um, being lighter because we weren't really focused on the actual weight. We just wanted to build the car out and have it be the way it needed to be, simple keeping a lot of the things factory on it. It still has all of the factory CAN bus wiring in it, most of the modules, basically everything besides the stereo is still in the car. Um, carpet from the front forward, and we really have just put lighter parts on the car. We haven't really removed very much. So to see it be at 2800 with me in it, I'm really excited that there's possibilities of this thing probably being in the 2500 range with a driver. Porsche to me is a brand that's always had kind of a different outlook on everything. The rear engine car is not good, like straight up. The mid engine car is much better, but Porsche said, we're gonna make this rear engine car work. And they kept working at it and pushing it and training drivers and figuring out how to make it one of the best cars. And now it truly is one of the best cars. When you drive a 70s or 80s or 90s Porsche, it's a bit of a handful, you know, and they've kind of brought that back. And I think that's what's important with drifting is the same thing. Like drifting is a bit of a handful. It's kind of a thing where you're not supposed to do it, but we're gonna keep working at it to make it perfect. So to me, the Porsche heritage matches drifting really, really well. So in 2024, I really wanted to kind of reinvigorate my drifting. And for me, drifting has always been about the evolution of everything. Like tires, suspension, chassis, tracks, drifting as a whole, uh, grassroots, like just being able to grow all of that is like my kind of purpose, at least for drifting, at least I see it that way. So 
throughout Formula Drift, throughout my career, I've always been just trying to get to that next level, that next thing. Sometimes that's bit me in the ass and I've lost because of it. But being ahead of the curve and pushing the boundaries is something that's been really important to me. And this Porsche 718 build, to me, is that next step of evolution. The suspension design, the car's look, the fact that this chassis has been around for a really long time, so there's low entry costs and nicer, higher entry costs. And there's kind of a big umbrella of things that go on under this chassis itself. I think it's really important to do something like this with mid-engine and not the 911 because the 911 is this heritage crazy car and this has kind of been the bastard car for a long time and I think that's why this should be the next like cool evolution of drifting and something that's new and exciting and something that I, I truly believe in.